I know skinwalkers and shapeshifters are a very common theme in Navajo culture and tradition, but I've had friends in multiple tribes and have been all over the US, and the whole shapeshifter tale has been a common reoccurring theme throughout many tribes, even in some parts of Canada that are more remote. Before I go on, I'm a crypto researcher, and so I've been able to make friends in many places. The stories I've gotten here have been incredible, and I really appreciate what you're doing on your channel by spreading the truth about these things being out there. Not just shapeshifters, all of them. Today, I wanted to share some shapeshifter accounts with you, since you do so many skinwalker-based stories. I'm sure you are familiar with what they are, who they are, and that they are strongly rooted in Navajo legend. While their intentions might be evil, they still have the tendency to abuse shape-shifting for the common end goal of black magic. A friend of mine who I've gotten to know over the years, who happens to be a mix of a few tribes, but is strongly Sioux, his grandfather and forefathers had tales of old men, hermits actually, that would live alone in the woods any time they were ever approached by opposing tribes or people they didn't know, they would shapeshift into a deer, a bird, or even a wolf. Now the skinwalkers in Navajo culture would primarily shapeshift into coyotes for the sake of instilling fear and harm on individuals. These shapeshifters were different. I'm not sure the type of magic they would practice, but it wasn't necessarily nefarious. These hermits wanted to be left alone and would shapeshift whatever they needed to be to avoid human contact. This is more common than you think. As this friend of mine explained to me, there were several tales from his tribe of multiple hermits and people doing this. Of course, they had their fair share of black magic practices who also shape-shifted to instill fear and malevolent gain. I feel like that's just a part of life. Some people are good and some people are evil. What interested me the most is that there is so much shape-shifting lore and many of these people's cultures. For the longest time I gained friends in other tribes, I was stuck to my belief that it was just a Navajo exclusive thing. Now I know different. Another friend of mine who I became very close with when I was going on several different Bigfoot expeditions down in Southern California is from a tribe down there. If you do decide to use this and record this, and he is listening, forgive me, for I forget the name of their tribe but he told me about what he was as a very young boy, that there was a pack of ravenous wolves that came in and invaded their small village and killed several men, women, and children. This pack of ravenous wolves was actually a small band of evil shapeshifters that would shapeshift into wolves to rape, steal, and kill. It was said that this small band of shapeshifters were evil men that were cast out of other tribes and villages for the evil deeds they committed to others. So basically, a small group of bandits that were shapeshifters. They were later captured and burned alive. Their remains were scattered and dumped into the rivers from when I was told, doing a sacred ritual, a cleansing ritual. The man who told me about this is in his 70s, possibly older, but because of his culture, they are usually in very great health and of sound mind. Many of their people don't make up stories for the purpose of notoriety. They have nothing to gain out of it, no incentive to feed me made up stories. He can remember them being burned alive as he witnessed it as just a young boy. This same man can also recall an elder when he was a boy who had left the tribe to go live in isolation. This older man also shapeshifted, but kept it a secret. He would often come and keep an eye on the village to protect it in the form of a bird. He said the bird would come or the old man and would watch over the children, the tribe's most vulnerable. The reason for this elder leaving the tribe to go live in isolation was that he was going to go and die by himself, but in reality, he had to hide his powers in some way. Personally, I don't know too much about that particular story because he didn't go into great detail. This is also a gentleman that I got the pleasure of sitting down with and discussing with him other findings I've received of other tribes, like Sioux and Navajo. I think the biggest thing he was surprised to hear is that there is so much magic that is practiced in other tribes and cultures. Growing up in the area, he had very little contact, if any, 
with any other tribes, let alone neighboring tribes. Information like this was new to him. These were not by far the craziest stories I've ever been told about shapeshifting. Years back, I was told about a few warriors from a tribe on the east coast who would shapeshift and hunt large predators to store back plenty of food for the winter. I don't know if they would do this in secrecy or if it was common knowledge among their tribe of people. Apparently, this particular tribe went through a really bad period of famine and turned to magic to feed their people. Only the strongest and wisest warriors among the tribe were hand-selected to learn these secrets to provide food for their entire tribe. They would shapeshift into bears or wolves from what I would gather and would go hunt those same animals. They would come back with even more abundant amounts of food to feed their tribe for the entire winter. Going back to Navajo and their culture, I've gotten to listen to many accounts and witness stories of skinwalkers, some far more terrifying than you could ever imagine. I've also heard of good skinwalkers, if that even makes sense. These are skinwalkers that were, I would call, rogue walkers. They were once evil and still maintained their demonic power, but decided to place that power out on other skinwalkers, meaning they wouldn't prey on innocent people any longer, but instead took their revenge out on other skinwalkers who preyed upon good people. I guess even after converting to the dark, some people can have a drastic change of heart. In the land of Navajo, whom I've also acquired many friends through throughout the years have expressed their concern for the unnatural animals that they've seen out there. They believe these to also be shapeshifters, but not necessarily skinwalkers. See, skinwalkers primarily take the form of coyotes and other animals, but I do know for a fact that it's mainly coyotes and other grotesque forms. They believe there's other shapeshifters at large that aren't exactly skinwalkers. They have reported seeing very large black panther-like cats roaming around, with evil intentions, scaring and chasing those who come across them. They are demonic, and to be warded away, I was told. They've also encountered pitch black grizzly-sized bears out in the middle of the night, something I hadn't heard of until a few family members came to me with their own sightings and stories. Thinking logically, there are of course black bears in most parts of the US, to my knowledge. But when they go and use descriptions talking about their gargantuan size and ill intention, it really sets me in a bad place. This tells me there are far more than just skinwalkers out and about, but some who enlist the use of dark magic to aid them has many possibilities on their ability to harm individuals. The grisly sized bears they've been seeing also have distinct markings on them, having more humanoid features, having either a panther or a large evil bear running after your car down the highway at night is equally terrifying, especially when they can keep up with you at 70 to 80 miles an hour. You know there is something bad at work there. An ex-reservation officer I had the pleasure of meeting spoke to me about how there was a smaller family that lived in the outskirts of the res many, many years ago that had been murdered apparently. Their bodies were then drug out to the middle of the desert and feasted upon. When they were found by the reservation police, there wasn't much left of them. They weren't devoured on by coyotes either, or birds. The chunks of meat taken out of them were large and still had bite marks on the intact parts of their leftover bodies. They attributed this to shapeshifters. This wasn't the only time this happened either. Throughout his time there as an officer, he had been witness to other bizarre happenings that were very similar driving at night, responding to a call and seeing a grown man running on the highway next to his police vehicle doing 60 miles an hour. A grown man running on all fours and then turning into a wolf before his very eyes. This man is had to defend himself with his firearm against these things. One time in particular, he shot at this massive panther that attacked him when he was off duty. It nearly killed him just before he could fire off a few good shots at it and drove it away. This officer explained that shapeshifters have a few distinct features about them that you'll know it's them. The first being is that they have a human look to their faces, even if they have fully shifted into an animal. The second is that they will have various markings or scars along their body or face. 
The markings comment is probably one of the first few times I've heard that, but that's what he said from his experiences. This man has had his fair share of dancing with death from these beings alone. The worst, he said, were the bears, because of how much damage they would cause to people, structures, and carcasses. This kind of stuff happens far more often than we would all like to believe. When you're cozy in little suburban neighborhood, at work at your bank or store, you never have to think about these things. These aren't real problems for us, but for these people, it's a life-threatening thing they have to deal with constantly and consistently. Even if these people aren't dealing with the evil persons who abuse magic to use this, shape-shifting is still very much a part of their culture and who they are as people. Some tribes it's more sacred than others. Stories and opinions will vary greatly depending on where you travel to and what tribe you speak to. I'll do what I can to gather up more stories for you and share them. When I was younger, I preferred to spend time at my great-grandmother's house rather than my own that I lived in with my grandmother. Being right next door, my grandmother would often let me spend the night with my great-grandparents to get me out of her hair. My grandparents had their own bedroom on one end of the house, and on the other end was the room in which I slept whenever I visited. This bedroom was big to a six- or seven-year-old, with a large bed that had sliding door cabinets for a headboard and two large windows, one of which had a crate of older toys in it, mostly building blocks and the likes, that faced this side yard, which had several young pine trees. The other window faced the large barn out back and housed their camper and all manner of other things. Before I continue, I ought to mention that I'm a quarter Native American, of the Miami tribe to be specific. My mother was adopted by a family whose heritage was distinctly French. While my grandmother wanted my mother and I to have nothing to do with our heritage, my great-grandmother embraced it, never kept it from us, and even taught us a little bit about it. Me, far less than my mother, since I was too young to understand, much before she passed. One night, when I was sleeping over at my great-grandmother's house, I woke up when the motion-detecting floodlight on the barn out back turned on. The room was flooded with light, and I could see everything clear as day. Unable to go back to sleep, I got up and decided to play with blocks until the floodlight went out and I could finally go back to sleep. For some reason, I felt the strange urge to look out the window into the side yard, so I climbed upon the crate under the window and peered out. There in the side yard was a young man. He was in his late teens, 17 to 19, with neatly cut straight black hair nearly ear length. He wasn't dark skinned, but he wasn't white either. He wore what looked like tan Carhartt overalls and appeared to be examining a young pine tree not 15 feet from the window. The tree wasn't very tall, maybe eight or nine feet, but the young man was carefully moving the bottom branches this way, and that as if to looking for something. I watched him for a minute or two, simply observing. I didn't feel frightened, rather I was curious. Then, the young man lifted his head and looked around. When he saw me, the strangest thing happened. He looked startled, then terrified. His eyes widened so far that I could make out the whites in the low light. There is no other way to explain what occurred after, other than the crazy sounding, he turned into a deer and bolted away into the darkness. He simply turned to his left made a drop to all fours and was a deer by the time what would have been his hands hit the ground. He ran off back beyond the barn. I don't remember the conversation I had with my great-grandmother about it in the morning, only that she seemed upset and was tight-lipped and that she and my great-grandfather went out to look at the tree later in the day. They didn't find anything, and my grandmother didn't want to hear about it, so I shrugged it off. Years later, I would learn what skinwalkers are, I would think back to this young man and how he could have been native, how his coveralls could have been deerskin. I would also think about my experience and it didn't line up with other skinwalker encounters. I didn't feel any fear. I didn't notice a stench. No one called my name. Also, the young man seemed to be afraid of me. Then again, I suppose if I was looking for something and I saw a small child staring at me at a window, 
I'd be a little freaked out too. As time went on, I had, for the most part, convinced myself that I had just happened to witness a teen boy hunting illegally on our property, and my startling him startled the deer he was after, and my child brain just processed it strangely. That is, until I decided to bring up the concept of skinwalkers with my mother. I had told her that I could have possibly seen one when I was a child if my memory could be trusted. When she said, Oh, so you saw the Birdman too, huh? My belief that I misremembered a teen boy hunting had shattered. She wouldn't say much about it when I seemed confused, simply stating, Oh, there was an old bald man who would dance around on the roof with his belt made of feathers, and when I would go out there to yell at him for being so loud, he'd smile at me and fly off as a bird. That house was on land that was tribal before the family. I was adopted and moved into the area several generations ago, artifacts coming to the surface every other time the big field behind my childhood home was plowed. Many others have had experiences there, including others of my own, though most of the other experiences seemed surreal, seemed to be things that could be brushed off as a coincidence or me psyching myself up to see or believe something that wasn't there. But that young man who turned into a deer sticks with me and has led me to be distrusting of deer and not just because they're a road hazard. I have had many other strange occurrences with deer since then, but none so unbelievable as the shapeshifter in the coveralls. I'm a 24-year-old male living in the Philippines. This is not even my story, but my dad's. It happened when I was a year old and my mother was pregnant with my younger sister. We lived in a semi-rural area where we had a lot of relatives and everybody knew each other in the neighborhood. My dad was out watering the plants in the backyard when he noticed a huge black bird perched on a low branch in a tree we used to have in our backyard. I know, big deal, right? Except the bird had unnaturally bloodshot eyes and looked back at my dad like it was thinking. My father, a bit unsettled, thought nothing more of it as he resumed his work and went inside afterwards. Hours pass and it was after dark. My dad went out again to do some more chores in our backyard. He was just finishing up when he noticed in the alley between our house and the fence separating us from the neighbors, some small creature shuffling across a puddle of water on the pavement. Now we had a pet turtle, a red-eared slider, and my dad thought that the turtle somehow got out of its tank and was making its way across the alley. But on closer inspection, he realized that it wasn't our turtle but, I kid you not, a crab. That's right, a crab, hundreds of miles away from any sea. It was huge, a dinner plate sized crab. And what further unnerved my father was that this crab, just like the bird earlier in the morning, bloodshot eyes. The crab stopped to look at my dad with, according to him, the same intense stare the bird gave him. My dad, having had enough, quickly went inside a bit creeped out at everything that had happened that day. The very next day, my father was speaking with the elders in the neighborhood at what he saw the previous day. They told him it was an Oswang. Now, in rural areas of the Philippines, there are stories of Oswangs, which are a kind of Philippine analog to vampire in Western folklore. They are said to be shapeshifters who enjoy feasting on human and animal entrails, but a favorite delicacy of Oswangs are unborn fetuses. An Oswang would crawl atop a roof at night, directly above a pregnant woman as she slept, slip its long tongue through an opening in the roof, and lap up the fetus like a mosquito would blood. As it happened, my mother was pregnant with my sister. One old man claimed he knew the Oswang that paid a visit to our home. He told my dad that this particular one wasn't trying to eat my sister, but that it just liked being around pregnant women. Like my mom, because it was intoxicating to all Aswangs. Doesn't make it less creepy though, and I'm glad that that Aswang was not one of the malevolent ones. It was an interesting story though. I should pay more visits to my dad to hear more stories from him. I don't know where else to share my story, so I've just come here to the first website that pops up when you search at Goatman. I don't really care where I post it. The only thing that matters is that it's posted. My name is Richard, but if you don't mind me doing so, 
I had preferred to skip the pleasantries and proceed with my needed story. I first came to know the tale of this frightful creature around a year ago during a school expedition that took us hiking through some desolate forest somewhere in rural England. The trip was actually completely normal and nothing disturbing happened whatsoever. But as we sat down at the campfire one night, one of the students whose name I didn't know suggested that we tell some scary stories around the campfire. As cliche as it sounded, we all agreed and decided to take turns. The student who came up with the idea stated that they would go first, as they had a pretty good story saved up for such moments as this. They told the tale of a humanoid creature that, for the most part, possessed a body of a human, but that it had the head and legs of a goat. Naturally, it was labeled as the goat man, and the student went on to speak of the creature and its endeavors into the awful. This story is the only one I remember from that night, with the rest of the stories all being based around the same generic plot concerning a bloodthirsty creature who is on the hunt for human flesh. Easily forgettable, to say the least. What scared me about the story of the goat man and successfully imprinted into my memory was that it supposedly didn't kill people, or rather it didn't kill them straight away. The goat man could shapeshift into any creature, be that a person or an animal. It didn't even need some ritualistic such as a drop of blood or anything crazy. It could just transform at will. I vividly remember the student ending his tale by reminding us once more that the goat man preferred to mentally exhaust its prey before ending their lives in a variety of unimaginable, gruesome ways. Although it would very rarely show itself in its true form, the student said, Victims would typically see it take dozens of appearances throughout very short time periods. This tale was slowly but surely pushed to the back of my mind over the next couple months, with me sitting important exams and entering a transition period where many students would leave my school in order to pursue their studies elsewhere, being replaced by a more optimistic bunch who were so happy throughout their first few days at school that it made the rest of us uncomfortable. You can relax though. They weren't brain-eating aliens sent from another planet to destroy the human race, and their blissful mood soon vanished, being replaced with a harsher, more realistic one that suited the repetitive nature of school life. During this transitionary period, a number of people I knew left the school, with some of my close friends throwing goodbye parties with other people, such as the student who first introduced me to the tale of the goat man, practically vanishing. The story of the goat man was forcefully reintroduced to me today during a trip I made to the National Art Gallery with a small group consisting of my two closest friends. We made our way through the various sections of the gallery over the course of a couple hours, but weird and seemingly unexplainable things would occasionally happen to the group of us. The most alarming of these things was most certainly when I witnessed firsthand my friend James exiting the room containing sunflowers through a door located on the right side of the room, before reappearing through the door on the opposite side of the room only moments later. This feat was clearly impossible due to the way the building was laid out, but when the remaining two of us started walking towards James and questioning how he had just done that, he quickly backed out of the door without uttering a word. We concluded this was a practical joke, but before we could exit the room after, James, he shouted to us from the right-hand side of the room, that he had initially exited out of. He yelled, You guys coming or not? And was seemingly clueless when we caught up to him and questioned him about the events that had just transpired. I was somewhat shaken by this initially, but refused to accept that it could have been anything but a joke. Whilst this was the only largely creepy thing that had occurred within the gallery, with the only other noticeable occurrences being a few people smiling at us in creepy ways and one woman who supposedly walked up to my friend Charlotte and began talking to her in a language Charlotte can only describe as cryptic. Things only got worse once we decided to depart. As we drove back to our town, I stared out the window and dozed off, suddenly awakening out of nowhere as the car stood stationary at some traffic lights. Rubbing my eyes, I gazed out of the window once again, but was jolted awake when I saw the kid who had first told me the story of the goat man all those months ago, staring at me from the other side of the road. He had an eerie grin on his face, but
but in true horror movie fashion. I did the stupidest thing imaginable and opened the car door before running up to him and smiling back. Fully prepared to catch up with him and asked where he'd been, I hadn't thought about the Goatman so far that day up until I saw the boy from the hiking trip standing there and looking back on it, I'm pretty sure that the Goatman knew this too. He wasn't willing to let me forget. Just before I made it to the other side of the road, a car came speeding out of nowhere, passed right in front of me, missing me by mere inches. I flinched and impulsively clenched my eyes shut, only opening them when I sensed the danger had passed. I almost jumped out of my skin when I focused on where the boy whose name I didn't know had been standing only come face to face with an elderly man who, despite his drastically changed features, wore the same creepy smile. I turned and sprinted back to the car, where my three friends had observed the entire event. I knew I couldn't have been hallucinating when I saw the looks of abject terror etched across their faces. I jumped in, closed the door behind me, and James slammed his foot down on the gas. The four of us sat in silence, with the only conversation we had occurring when James attempted to pull into his driveway before Charlotte shouted at him to turn the car around and head towards the nearest police station. He began to question her, but she cut him off and the desperation in her voice told us that something was very wrong. James kept his eyes on the road as he drove towards the station, and Charlotte looked out the window as she sat next to him, occasionally catching my gaze as she glanced back in my direction, a look of unwavering concern overshadowing her usually calm demeanor. We eventually reached the police station and I got out of the car. We reached the door to the station before Charlotte grabbed me and twisted me around, forcing me to look back at the car. I caught a glimpse of a figure dragging its leg behind it as it shuffled off in the other direction, features indistinguishable in the cover of the night. What? I asked her as I observed the figure, somewhat rationally assuming it was somebody departing from the police station after having been interviewed regarding an injury for their leg. Richard! She whispered to me, voice evidently close to giving out and within tears in her eyes. That thing, it was in the car with us. Did you somehow not notice it? There were three of us in the car when you arrived and began to leave the gallery. But a while after you got back, I caught sight of it. It was sitting next to you in the back. I was watching it from the wing mirror and the car and it just sat there, smiling at you for the entire journey with this horrible, indiscernible smile. Her voice trailed off as she finished her sentence, and I was left more terrified than I'd ever been in my entire life. There was no way I couldn't go an entire hour-long car journey without noticing somebody sitting next to me. It was impossible, and I knew it. Yet, it had happened. My feet gave out from the sheer panic I was experiencing and I collapsed to the floor with an audible thud. Now, my eyes were filling up with tears too, but I swear I saw the silhouette in the distance turn around to look at me one final time before shuffling off into the night. The police heard us out, but took no action as all we really had to talk about was a couple of people smiling at us creepily and an account of somebody slipping into our car. Having been noticed by the person who sat in the passenger seat in front, and yet somehow, evading the sight of James and myself, despite supposedly staring at me for the entire journey. I explained to them the story of my hiking trip and of the goat man, but it was met with raised eyebrows despite my pleading and protesting. By this point, I would have started questioning my own sanity had I not been sitting next to two others who had shared this horrific experience with me. Eventually, the police said they'd come and visit each of our houses the following morning for more information after we had slept, and that we should call them if anything else out of the ordinary happened. They escorted each of us home, and we decided to reconvey the following day at James's house in order to try and piece together what had happened over the course of the day. I was the last to be dropped off, and the officer who was driving the squad car told me that they'd keep a unit on standby throughout the night, and then it would be dispatched to my address immediately should I dial the emergency services. He flashed me a smile as he rolled up the window of his car, and I froze momentarily before shrugging it off. I was able to muster a faint laugh as I looked at my predicament, with me now being so paranoid that I was coming within inches of a heart attack whenever somebody did so much as smile in my direction. 
However, my fears were very reasonable, and maybe, just maybe, I was correct to have been scared by his smile. I dared not look back as I made the long walk up my driveway and into my house, being so sure to lock and bolt the door behind me before searching the entire house for any open windows. Every window in the house was closed, but that didn't stop me from locking them too. I tried sleeping in my room with the lights on, but I found that my mind refused to rest, instead desired to wander. I came up with endless explanations, but there was one so terrifying that I was forced to get out of my bed and roam around the house, keeping any suspicious movement going on outside. Perhaps it should have been obvious to me earlier, but I'd had so much going through my head that I'd only just come to the realization that I'd never seen the boy who told me about the goat man and appeared to be on my side of the road, anywhere apart from on that hiking trip. Desperate to be proven incorrect, I grabbed my yearbook and began frantically tearing out the pages. Minutes later, I was a sobbing mess, having gone through the entire yearbook but not found a single person resembling him. Now it was clear to me, the goatman himself was the one who had told me the tale of the goatman and the boy he was capable of shape-shifting into must have been a past victim or something along those lines, seeing as I'd never seen him in my life before or after the night where he first told us the story. At least, that was the case, up until today. As I'm writing this, I'm sitting at the table in my living room. I have all the doors locked and windows bolted, with a piece of furniture propped up against each one to prevent anyone or anything from entering. I also have the radio on loud to drown out all the sounds emanating from upstairs, those being the occasional creaking of the floorboards and other noises which I cannot identify. To be fair, I do live in a very old house, so perhaps those sounds can be rationalized. I have my mobile next to me, just one tap away from calling the police. It's 8pm, and that means my parents should get home from their evening out in around two hours. I'll just sit tight until then, staring out the window into my garden. Thankfully, nothing can get into my house without walking up the drive and passing through the well-lit front garden first, so I'll be able to call the police immediately if anything or anyone who I don't recognize starts approaching. My dog is lying flat on the floor a couple of meters from me, staring up at me with a vacant expression. I think it can sense fear. Nothing can get into my house without making an awful amount of noise. I know that now. I will have time to flee and call the police on my mobile before anything bad happens to me. You see, there's just one problem that I blatantly ignored during my over-analysis of the situation. My parents took our dog with them on their trip. Whatever is currently lying meters away from me on the kitchen floor knows it cannot possibly be my dog, and as it begins to convulse, I fear it's realized that I've just come to the same conclusion. I met my best friend Ben when I was 19. We started a degree in music together and had absolutely nothing in common, which we loved about each other. What shocked us was how in sync our childhoods had been. From being born two weeks apart to the age of 12, we shared a lot of experiences even though we never met. I remember Ben telling me about a VHS he used to have with cartoons on it, saying how obscure it was and how I'd love it. I replied that I knew exactly which VHS he was referring to and also still had a copy of it. This sort of thing happened a lot between us, so we liked to quiz each other from time to time and then joke about how different we were for our identical upbringings. One night, when I was staying over at Ben's house, we got on the topic of kids' ghost stories. I love creepy stories, but Ben hates them. So, the conversation was slow going at first. We started with the usual stories kids in the neighborhood spread. It was funny how many of our town's stories were exactly the same for being opposite sides of the city and river, 10 miles from each other. The dilapidated places were always haunted. We both had heard about a one-eyed black cat nobody owns that watches the children who play out. The list of stories went on, and so did the similarities. Ben, surprisingly, into the discussion. So, you've ever heard of this story? Etc., to which I confirmed or told my town's slightly different version of the story. 
That's how the night progressed. After we exhausted the conversation, he ended with, Even to this day, I'm scared of the dogman, so please tell me you've heard that story too. I just remember being dumbfounded, saying I had no idea what a dogman was. As far as I'm aware, the dogman's story is just in Ben's town. We tried looking on the internet, but Ben was too easily freaked out by the pictures and scary stories that popped up as we searched. The dogman really grabbed my attention. Usually kids' ghost stories get into so much detail, like the color of the ghost's dress, or the exact way the hair hangs over the ghost's eyes. But there wasn't much info about dogmen. The details were vague. His words at the time were something like, The older kids who were allowed out the street told us about dogmen, who stood around in the alleys at night, and the older kids were shamelessly scared to go there when it got dark. Obviously, it was thugs or druggies, I explained. But he was adamant. No, because they ran away when they noticed the kids watching them. They'd climb up the high walls of the back alley into people's backyards really fast, without making any noise. The older kids wouldn't talk about it unless pushed. He said their feelings seemed too real to make it to a joke to scare the younger kids. His childhood friend Wes claimed to have saw one too. The story goes that the dogmen would be found standing in the small groups and more solitary in the middle of an alley, looking for scraps of food, not doing much else. Ben seriously thinks he saw one with his mom one day walking back from shopping. Apparently, it was in a fenced off area where a block of flats had been demolished just a few years prior. At the opposite side of this land, he saw a skinny, hunched-backed man cupping his hands full of water from a stream which ran through the plot, washing his long, greasy hair, almost ritualistically. Even though he didn't see the homeless man's face and was quite far away to make out details, he swears something about the man wasn't quite human. I blamed a child's imagination and exaggerated memories, but he swears it. He showed me the area that next morning. If he and his mother are remembering correctly, I have no idea why even a homeless man would wash his hair in that dirty stream. I first met Wes a few weeks after that night that I learned about the dogman, and didn't hesitate to ask for his first-hand account of the dogman. It was the main reason I decided to meet him, after all. His description was similar to Ben's, but his encounter was far more close up. Wes lived from the local corner shop than Ben and used to take a shortcut through an alley when he walked there. The wheelie Ben's route that day, he said he could hear a cat or dog fending on some discarded food behind one of the bends. It happens a lot, and everybody knows to keep a distance so the dog won't get aggravated and attack. But Wes said the dog didn't look right. He only got a quick glance before it ran behind a wall with a rotten roast chicken hanging from its mouth. According to his memory, it was running more like a hyena than a normal dog with its shoulders held much higher than its hips. The snout was too short, and the ears were more elven than a dog's. He can't remember if the creature had fur or not, but it definitely was naked. Not long after, he overheard the older kids talking about dogmen, and realized what he had saw. I like Wes. He has a doubting attitude akin to mine, and admitted his memory may have been influenced by the older kids' stories. It could have just been a normal dog struggling to carry a whole chicken away after being startled. The story lay dormant, not mentioned for months after I spoke to Wes. In that time, I had moved away and have only managed to visit Ben three times since then. The last time I met with him, we decided to go to the local takeaway in the early hours of the morning, and I got my very own encounter of what could have been the dogman. Right on that same abandoned plot where Ben saw the homeless man bathing, there was a decent-sized fire burning. I could make out possibly three silhouettes huddled around the flames. Ben's area is pretty rough, so this isn't an unusual sight, but I don't know how to describe it. Those figures weren't moving naturally. My view wasn't great because Ben wouldn't move closer than we were, but I swear those silhouettes never stood completely upright. We watched them for about five minutes. They were hunched over with their backs up, warning and warming their gloves and hands by the fire with their hoods up. I remember one of them moving closer to the fire while keeping its hands on the ground. It would have been easier to just stand and walk closer, but it shuffled awkwardly using its arms. 
Everything about their movement was indescribably awkward. I was so excited. It had to have been the dogmen. I didn't want them to spot us, so we left pretty soon after that. But I forced Ben to visit the bonfire with me the next day. There was just a milk crate that sat next to a charred circle on the ground. Nothing to prove these beings were inhuman. Strangely, there were bones in amongst the smoldering papers and branches that had been burning the night before. We could make out scooty handprints where at least one of the homeless people had presumably crawled over to the charred ground. The trail of handprints led away from the bonfire and faded after a couple of meters. That was all we found. We walked away feeling slightly silly, laughing at how we had probably been stalking a trio of drunk tramps. However, Ben's realization unnerved us terribly. As the hand shell faded, he pointed out a large paw print becoming more and more prominent in the middle of the fading handprints. Then, it struck me why I found their gait so weird the night before. As the man had walked closer to the fire, he placed his feet in exactly the same spot where his hands had been. We stared in shock, not sure what to make of the trail. Then the yelps and growls of the dogs fighting came from a bush uncomfortably close to us. I'm not ashamed to say we ran away crapping ourselves. Maybe it was just a pack of dogs. We didn't care to look, and I'm never going back there to find out. I was out camping with some friends just a couple of months ago, and I had an extremely bizarre and somewhat terrifying encounter that I cannot explain. We decided to go and camp near Bullfrog Marina, Lake Powell, Utah, and since the primitive campground was closed due to COVID, we decided to find a camp spot on a nearby road. We spent the first night in an hallucinogenic fueled state, with the full moon shining above us. It was truly an amazing spiritual experience. The next day, we went down to the beach at Bullfrog Marina and spent the day in the sun. And when we got back to the camp, most of my friends decided to take a nap. My brother and I knew that if we took a nap, that we may as well call it a night. So, we chose to go explore the gully and the dry riverbed below our camp. It was beautiful, a very beautiful area. We actually found a bullfrog hopping around and what we determined to be lemur footprints. It was after dusk at this point and was starting to get pretty dark. I told my brother that I wanted to check out this little canyon near the riverbed before we went back to camp. He agreed, so we made our way into the canyon. It was actually pretty dark in the canyon and I only had a small flashlight with me. I was walking in front and my brother behind me. I figured that it was a fairly small canyon, and I assumed that the rock wall that I was looking at near the back of the canyon was the end. But as I thought we were nearing the end, I noticed that the canyon actually curved back more to the right. As I saw that, that it went back further than I speculated, I remembered that it is not uncommon for there to be bobcats and cougars in this area. I started feeling a little uneasy at the thought of it being a potential den for a predator. When a breeze blew into the canyon, and the bush near me moved as a result of the wind. Oh shit, I said, and my brother responded with, What? Seeing that I was startled. Oh, it was just a bush, I replied, as I made my way around the bush and peered in the back of the canyon. I saw something walking toward me at a fairly fast pace. Oh my, go! I hollered at my brother and we ran back up the embankment in the canyon to higher ground. What? What did you see? He asked me, as I was shutting my light down near the bush that I was near earlier. I saw something darting toward me. That was terrifying, I replied. What did it look like? He asked. It looked humanoid, bony, and standing on two legs, I said. He felt uneasy too at this point. I couldn't see too well, it is so dark in here. Maybe it was my imagine. Right as I said that, my light shined down on two eyes behind the bush, swaying as if it was trying to get a better look at us to the bush. We need to go, I yelled, and we took off out of the canyon. We made it back to the riverbed and paused for a moment. I looked back to see if whatever it was that whatever I saw was following us. 
We saw nothing at this point, and we kept moving back toward our camp. Part of me wanted to go back for a better look, because I've always wanted to experience something supernatural, if that is what this was. But the other part of me wanted to get out of there. Eventually, we made it back to the camp, and our friends were still sleeping. We ate a little food, and once we winded down a little bit, we decided it was best to go to bed. When we woke up the next day, as we're getting ready to head home, I told my friends what had happened, and they were freaked out hearing my story. One of my friends told me that he woke up to the sounds of somebody walking around his tent in the middle of the night. He said he thought it was one of us, but hearing that made him think it could have been someone or something else. I still do not know what I saw that night, but the thought of it still frightens me to this day. Most of my family lives out on the reservation, but I moved states away many years ago to get out of that hellhole. I've since started a new job and a new life in other places. I much prefer the greenery of Southern Oregon than I do the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona. I still make trips back to see my family every so often, and unfortunately, as much as I don't want to believe it to be true, we do have our encounters with dark spirits. Just this last time I was there, my brother believes he was followed home by what he believes what you would call a skinwalker. We have a name for them, and our culture does, but I'm not going to mention it because I don't want to bring attention to it. He was coming back from a friend's house, and he said he made eye contact with this strange looking person covered in animal skins walking alongside the road in the middle of the night. It wasn't pitch black yet, but it was dusk bright enough to where he could still see the person's face. He drove by, and they made complete eye contact, and he told me he felt like this person attached itself to him. I blew him off and didn't really know what he meant. I thought he was just huffing and puffing. He said he could feel this person's energy attached to him and his vehicle, and then the person started sprinting after his truck. He only drove faster, but then when he looked back up in his rearview mirror, the person was gone. He kept driving, but then only a few minutes later, noticed this abnormally large coyote running alongside his truck, about 100 or feet or so out in the desert, staying parallel with him. It looked very mangy and had very unnatural sunken in eyes. He just got bad feelings from this thing and decided to lead it astray instead of leading it directly back to the house. He pulled through some different areas and neighborhoods and took a very long way home. He lost track of it at some point, but he's still sure that it's watching him somewhere. Sometimes he used to always think the whole skinwalker jargon was just a bunch of crap, but the more time I spent with my family out here, the more I realized there is a lot more truth to it than I would like to accept. You can be even trying your best to stay out of it, but that still doesn't guarantee you safety. Luckily, we have medicine men in our family who can pray and protect over us, but these things still, I just, I feel like they have too much power. I don't feel like medicine men is enough to protect us. This is one of the reasons that I feel so much safer having moved to Oregon and far away. I know Southern Oregon isn't exactly a safe zone per se, but much better than being at ground zero where these things thrive and feed off the torment of the weak. I know for a fact that skinwalkers are real, or if they are not skinwalkers, they are something. A month ago, in June, I was driving through the reservation with a friend of mine when we stopped a pullover to go pee outside. I decided to have a quick cigarette real quick when my friend had to drain the pipes. We felt a weird energy as soon as we got out of the car. There were no other cars around in the visible vicinity. Out here, you can see other cars coming for a long ways away, just because of how flat it is. We did, however, have a wonderful view of the mesas and the red desert that spanned forever. We're not from around the Navajo Reservation, but we've had many friends from the area, so we're familiar with the terrain. As I was saying, the energy, it felt very off. My friend's pissing in the one sage bush, and I'm puffing away on my cigarette, when off in the desert, we see this tall, skinny black figure 
with what looks to be a skull-type head, stand out from behind a large bush and begin walking towards us slowly. I start saying to my friend, do you see what I'm seeing? And I kid you not, midstream, he starts freaking out and pointing, saying, what is that thing? Why is it coming towards us? We need to get out of here. The best I can describe to you is the body reminded me something like Slender Man or something. Very tall, very lanky, but obviously not 13 feet tall or anything creepypasta or unrealistic looking. Probably more 7 to 8 feet tall, if I had to guess. Not too much taller than I. It reminded me whatever it was in was long tattered black robes or something. They were very dirty. Again, it was very slender. The head looked to be that of a goat skull or something weird. It was a skull though, I can tell you that. And from the distance it was away from us, it was as clear as day that it was a skull that had some sort of horns on it, like possibly a goat skull. And it was walking on two legs toward us, very slowly, never breaking stride or eye contact. Although, even the way it moved seemed incredibly weird. It didn't bob up and down like a person normally does when they take a stride. It kind of glided. Even though there were points where there should have been visible legs, it was just a long black tattered rope from what I can tell, and it stayed unmoving. But again, it was very slow and steadily moving towards us. Who knows why or what it was? Since my friend and I are familiar with the area, we've had friends who are native to these parts and have their own stories to tell. Stories that I've always written off, but I've had some stories from friends that were terrifying in a way. Part of the reason I've always wanted to avoid coming to the reservation. Even though in my own mind, I wanted to deny it as much as I possibly could. I guess the question I should be asking is were we targeted for a reason? Could it have just been a mere coincidence that we were at the wrong place at the wrong time? My friend and I jumped back into the car and got out of there. I don't recall ever being so afraid of my life, and I'm not one to buy into the whole creepy pasta BS. I would like to think that it was somebody in a costume trying to spook us, but who would be out there in the middle of the desert on a 110 degree day in full costume? It doesn't make any sense. We were only out there for maybe two minutes, if even that, before we saw this thing. We were laughing and joking, making noise, but I didn't think we were that loud but I'm guessing that maybe this thing had hurt us. I grew up around many Navajo and Apache natives who have shared with me many ancient tales and warnings not to travel into certain blacklisted regions in the deserts for what evil lurks there. People who started villages and sects of life were destroyed by this evil, the same evil that is said to come from deep within the Sonoran Desert has made its way far north to where we thrive and inhabit. I myself am half native and try and embrace my culture and belief system as much as I can. There is truth to the wisdom that is spoken to me through my people and friends. I have a deep love for this nation and do not wish to see it tarnished by the black magic of those evil doers that wish to wreak havoc upon it. The peace that is currently being upheld today is only because of certain protections and wards against those of the darkness, the Great Spirit. I know your channel is all about bringing alertness to these creatures that exist and practice evil out in the world so that they can grow in their power and prey upon the weak. But I can share this information with you and in hopes that you can share it on your channel and then maybe more people will become aware of what truly exists out there and to stay away from. The more victims these creatures of evil claim, the more power they obtain, the more reign they have. You have spoken much about the shapeshifters of my land that practice magic and wear the skins of coyotes and other kills, but there is a far more powerful and smaller sect of shapeshifters that lie beneath the ground in caverns and underneath the deserts. The more power they obtain, the more their influence reigns in my region, the Navajo Nation, and even further north. These shapeshifters take the form of large desert reptilian serpents, 
serpent beings that devour dreary wanderers and tourists alive, or capture them to be taken back to have the life force sucked out of them. I've heard others call this same life force Andrenochrome. I believe that's the scientific name for it, but that's what these shapeshifters feed on. They come out at once, the sun is set in the sky, to wander the deserts at night, seeking those that they can prey upon easily. They are said to inhabit the bowels underneath the sands. There are many caverns underneath the deserts that should be closed up, and people should stay far away from. Several have already been turned into tourist attractions for those that enjoy underground caverns. This is very dangerous, and potentially invoking the presence of these beings. I'm still not clear whether this sect of shapeshifters is even humans, or something far more vile. Unlike the shapeshifters here, these entities possess far greater strength and can hide away much easier, revealing themselves only when they want to be revealed. They will even go as far as camouflaging themselves as a regular native, just to try and lure persons from nearby tribes away. I don't think it to be a coincidence that these shapeshifters are the only things to come out of the area of the desert. My people have talked about flying demons that also live beneath the desert sand. I personally believe these to be in alignment with these shapeshifters, or possibly even under their control to scout the area, looking for the next victim. I'm giving you this information because people who want to tour the area, or just passing by, need to be extremely aware and understand that driving through the area at night is incredibly dangerous. You need to be very careful, and you wouldn't believe me if I told you how many people go missing that are taken captive by these things, but are written off as lost to sex trafficking. It's horrendous. I'm just trying my best to keep my people safe by informing the uneducated. Please, it would mean the world to me if you could share this message. At least many who listen to it will take my warning and understand the true dangers that lie outside beneath the sands. My uncle, who is a Navajo Nation police respondent, came across a group of teenage girls huddled together on the morning hours of September 1st, 2018, startled, crying, and frightened by something. They were far out in the desert, miles from the nearest road, and claimed to be driven there by what they described as a man who turned into a demon. The man was not like your typical skinwalker and did not wear animal skins in religious garments. He dressed with a black clay covering his entire body and a single loincloth. And then he changed into this demon, they said, with eyes so black they were almost white. This man, or demon, was intent on killing them, so it chased these girls far out in the middle of the night in the desert. It grabbed one of the girls, ripped a clump of her hair out, and she had a huge clump of hair missing. Blood had dried and ran down her scalp. One of the girls that was with them was reported missing and was actually never found, even after a thorough investigation had been in full effect. The four girls out of five claim this demon man took this girl and took her away. They have no clue to where he took her. The girls were questioned why they were there and what they were doing. The nearest road being only a few miles away, they were en route to going home after a party in the early morning hours when they got a flat. While trying to change the tire, they were approached by a fierce looking man who came out of the desert and threatened them with rape and violence which led to him physically chasing them into the night where they ran for a long time, where they were eventually found huddled up together around this large rock. The slowest of the girls was the youngest at 14 and was the one that was grabbed and taken away. Stories like this happen all the time here on the reservation and it's kept very quiet, so not often words get out. Encounters with beings like skinwalkers and evil spirits are far more common than just drunks and thieves. It's a dangerous world out here, and it's currently not welcome to visitors, even if they are of Navajo descent.
My story takes place along the Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. I encountered a handful of strange creatures, or what I would like to call desert witches that can shapeshift into reptilian beings. I would later find out from an experienced Navajo men and women that this was indeed true, and of course my friend. At the time, I was with my ex-wife, who during the time was my current wife. For the story, I will call her Jamie. I also feel the need to point out though that even the canyon isn't quite on Navajo reservation. It does border, and many of the Navajo have experienced wandering through the same canyon. Their experiences, from what I've learned, are very grim, to say the least, or so what I've heard. They claim this to be the territory of shape-shifting witches, not the same thing as a skinwalker, I'm told. On this day, we were the only few people on the trail, and nobody else was really around. The isolation being bittersweet, although I rather enjoy the privacy, it made the situation so much more heightened. On this day, we made our way about a mile and a half down into the canyon before the strange lady was walking in our direction, muttering some strange things under her breath. We got a really weird feeling about her and kept away. She wore a strange veil over her face and her clothes seemed out of place. I can't quite place the description that would accurately describe to you what she had, but it reminded me of Middle Eastern clothing we soon forgot about her and continued walking past and continued on. Shortly after, we began to hear strange sounds behind us and around us. My wife Jamie at the time began to express to me that she felt uncomfortable, like she was being watched. I told her to look around that there's nobody out here. I didn't hear the sounds, only she did. She still couldn't budge the feeling though, and we soon found an area to sit down at to take a break and have some water and collect ourselves. We were in conversation for only a couple of minutes before we began to hear, both of us, what I would describe as religious chanting. It seemed to be coming from all around us and nowhere at the same time. Behind us, around us, above us and below us. I thought we were hallucinating, but it kept getting louder and louder. Jamie and I can both hear it, as we're both frantically looking around, trying to find the source of this noise when this chanting starts to evolve into something much more disturbing. Growls and roars. The chanting grew and grew in volume, and then began to fade in sounds as the growls and roars took over. And then there was no more chanting, just roaring and growling. It sounded close by, but also far away. With the canyon structure and the rocks, I know the sounds can reverberate and play tricks on your ears, making you think there is something much closer than it actually is. Now, there was no more chanting, but it sounded like there were 20 lions trapped behind a rock or something, and it was seriously giving both of us the creeps. I didn't even have to motion to Jamie for us to get out of there before we ditched. Later on that day, after we had left, I told a close friend of mine what had happened who happens to be full-blooded Navajo and knows the area around the reservation in the canyon and multiple other areas very well. He seemed scared when I told him what happened and told me that I had apparently witnessed a shape-shifting ceremony, or at least heard it. This is what he described to me, that they were shape-shifting witches that go down into the canyon and they usually sacrifice humans or animals and drink the blood and turn into these creatures. He did not exactly specify if there needed to be a sacrifice for them to shapeshift, but he did make it clear that they would get together and have some sort of ritual ceremony and turn into creatures. That would explain the loud roaring I heard and growls. It was terrifying, even if his story that he told me did seem far-fetched. It matched up with everything we heard, which is terrifying. It would also explain the religious chanting that I heard. It very well reminded me of something you would hear out of the occult, or something along those lines in just another language. This can be marked as easily one of the scariest experiences I've ever had in my life, but I just can't explain what it is.
I knew the history of my ancestors were cursed. Ever since I was a little boy, I had dreamed of being born at an earlier time so I could get my own tribal name and possibly bring our family's name more honor. Today, everyone just sees us as a permanent refugee or casino owner. My family's past is complicated and a difficult one. I always try and ask my grandmother or great-grandmother why that is. They would tell me tales that have been passed down from our ancestors since the late 1700s. My grandmother tells me not to bother my great-grandmother with such foolish questions from her childhood, simply because there's no way in her old age that she would ever remember them. Unfortunately, my great-grandmother has come down with dementia. She has her good days, and she has very terrible days. One day, I had come over to spend time with my family, and she began having one of her episodes. She walked around the house, speaking in the way of the old tongue, in which I had no idea how to speak. Our family got somewhat lazy in passing on the tradition of our language. I can make out a few words, but not many. However, one that I could pick up that she repeatedly kept saying was monster. My grandmother took her to her bed because she needed rest. I stayed the night at the house because I wanted to make sure she was all right. I checked in on her later and asked her if she was okay. She said that she was and I asked her what monster it was that she was talking about. She said that she would tell me as long as I promised not to tell grandmother that she told me. When she was a little girl, growing up with our ancestors and our tribe, she would occasionally get into trouble and sneak out of the village a lot to explore the woods and the wildlands around the area. She remembers that when she was younger, her mother would take her out back to forage for berries. She remembered that berry patch as having the sweetest berries around. Those were like candy for her. When she knew that she wouldn't be spotted by anybody, she would sneak out of the berry patch and eat some of the berries and play with her doll there. One day, when she was out there, she noticed a rather large fox skulking about. She gasped and ran, but the fox was more afraid of her than she was of it, and it too ran away. Thinking she was safe, she stayed there and continued playing with her doll and eating berries. A while later, one of the adults from the tribe found her there. He was a tall man that wore a fox pelt over his shoulders. He must have found the fox from earlier and skinned it. She snuck out again the next day, and for a while, that became her normal routine. She had told her mother and father that she was playing with some of the other younger children and that she would sneak out to the berry patch. When she went out to the berry patch this time, all the berries were gone. She kept going through the patch until she found more, but she could not find any. She walked farther and farther away from the village, and before she came to a clearing, she saw that man again, the man that had killed the fox the other day. He still had the fox pelt on his shoulders, but what came next, she did not expect. Right before her very eyes, he transformed. This large man became this rather large fox, the same fox she saw the other day. His large forearms turned and formed into hind legs and paws. His legs shaped backward and became strong hind legs of the fox. He was now hunched over, and fur was growing all over his body. Large orange fur tufts came out of his body like weeds. She could only see him from his backside, and then he began looking around to see if he could spot anything. He was facing away from her, until she caught a glimpse of his bright yellow eyes. They searched the tall grass for signs of watchers, turning ever so slowly towards her. She could see his entire body now, and this was no ordinary fox. This was probably three times bigger than a normal one. His paws were the size of large rocks, his white chest and underbelly still toned and cut from human form. She said his body looked so strong you could shoot an arrow at it, and the arrow would break. His arms and legs were clearly defined and muscled from numerous previous hunts he has probably been on. She noticed his nose was moving oddly. His nose was twitching, trying to smell something. 
The more he turned her away and kept smiling, the more she realized he was smelling her. The creature started taking low prowling steps towards her, and it spotted her. It was now hunting her. She knew if she didn't run, it would get her. She stood up and ran as fast as she could through the tall grass, and cried out for her mother and father, over and over, hoping that somebody would hear her. This beast, this monster began chasing her, but not quick enough to catch her, just quick enough to stay on her trail. Whether that was intentional or not is unknown. She ran past the empty berry patch and continued to cry out for her mother and father, screaming the word monster. She made it out of the berry patch, but by that point, it was too late. The beast had pounced on her. It ravished her clothes, trying to bite into her, when a spear came over and struck the beast in the head. It cried out loud and took off into the tall grass. A hunter from the village had saved her. Her mother and father were mad that she took off, but were relieved that she was saved by that hunter. After that day, she never ventured out of the village again alone, in fear of seeing that terrible beast shapeshifter. Obviously, shapeshifters are a huge part of my ancestry and legends, but sometimes what we think of as tall tales are more than just that. There is truth to them. Had that hunter not saved her that day, that man-beast would have taken her. Whether he practiced magic or not is unknown, but it's possible he could have been a skinwalker. With all the great things about my ancestors that I can really admire, there are very dark parts of our past, and that, the art of shapeshifting, is one of them. I would have to say that growing up in the age of strong men, beasts, and evil, it would be hard to scare somebody like me. As someone who fought in the Second Great War, I've seen and heard some very bad things that the world of men is capable of. Some of those things I have done myself, but never before had I seen something as twisted or demented as this up to my point in life. The year was 1942, and the Germans were holding an encampment of ours farther to the east, just south of the Belgian border. Our troops were deployed and we were told to help push the Germans out of the occupied territory. Knowing what I did now, I probably would have never gone with the squad that day if I had a choice. Of course, I didn't, and of course, I had no idea what was to come out on the battlefield. Before the war, I was a high school history teacher, so I knew a lot about what happened in the first war. I knew a lot about what the Germans were capable of from the first war. Of course, we didn't know about them at all, and the experimentation they had done and continued to do during the second war, but I knew enough that it could be more than helpful than just holding a gun. When the Germans began using gas to attack our soldiers, I was lucky enough to be at the front lines when they hit us with it. I managed to hold back some of our troops and saved a few lives from it. However, one of the Redskins assigned to our group got hit with it pretty bad. I don't particularly like their people, mainly because they hardly have ever bothered to learn American English. But after that day, he changed my mind about them. He began choking on the gas profusely, and all I could do was hunker down behind a building and wait for the gas to clear so we did not get shot down. The Germans were brutal. After they sent the gas in, they retreated so those who got hit could suffer. Everyone but he died. He was choking on the gas, trying to breathe when all of a sudden, he stopped. I sighed, feeling bad that another one of ours had died, and then I watched as he stood up from where he was, picked up his rifle, and charged at the enemy like nothing at all had happened. I'm not sure if anybody else saw what I saw, but I knew we couldn't go after him, as the gas was still lingering. We were told to pull back for the night, and by the morning, we would pick it up again and try and take that part of the city back. When morning came, I packed up my gear and three of us went to do a perimeter check to make sure it was safe to roll out. Only us and two other squads had made it. There were about 20 of us between the three squads left 
and 12 or so missing or MIA. We cleared the perimeter and were ordered to push on slowly while we waited for reinforcements from Belgium. What we saw, I don't think any of us could have believed. The Germans had made an encampment at the edge of town, waiting for us. It funneled into two large streets at the end with two or three machine gun nests pointed at us. I thought we were goners, but what really stuck out was how much blood there was everywhere. Dead Germans laid everywhere, some over sandbag bunkers, some by the sides of the buildings, some in large piles that had been set on fire. It was giving off a slight red hue as the smoke trailed into the sky. I can remember it clearly. As we neared the machine gun nests, we found that all of the guns were broken and destroyed in some way. On further inspection of the dead German, it had looked as if their throats had been torn out or had been stabbed in the chest, but not with a blade. It looked as if these enemies were all attacked by a bunch of wild animals. There were at least 40 or 50 dead, a sizable force with a large amount of firepower. As we cleared the area to make sure all the Germans were dead, which they were, I came across one man who had been torn to shreds, not by what looked like an animal attack, but by gunfire. It was the Redskin. He lay partially naked with only his torn pants covering him, painted by his own blood and what must have been the blood of others as well. I inspected him and he was shot three times in the chest. That must have been what killed him. I thought the Germans must have taken him after he ran off and he was killed by whatever else had killed the Germans. I started to pick him up so we can take him back to the sent home to his family. But when I did, his jaw fell open and somewhat large pieces of something fell out of his mouth. I picked it up and it was covered in blood and I began wiping it off. It didn't look like something that came from his body because a piece of it shined. When I finally got done brushing it off, it appeared to be a piece of dog tag with German writing on it. It was him. He must have done all this. When I thought I was going crazy, I checked under his fingernails and there were pieces of dried bloody flesh underneath them. I freaked out. I dropped his body and began to turn away and run when my sergeant had stopped me. Panicked, I told him we had to warn command about the others in case of other redskins were capable of doing the same thing. He told me that I wasn't to say a thing to anybody and reassured me that the redskins, as I so called them, was a hero. That he put his life down and saved us by killing so many of the enemy. Knowing that command wouldn't believe a word of what happened there, he ordered us to burn all the bodies and told me to burn his especially so nobody but he or I would know what happened that day. After we had finished that, he was to report it back to command as a friendly pilot, but had helped us out during the night and had hit all of their soldiers so we could press on. I didn't find out till much later in life when the internet was made that he was what they called a skinwalker. I had never been honored to know such a man in all my life. I knew him only a short while, but he was one of the bravest men I ever knew. I wouldn't learn this until much later, but back in that time, the military was deep into exploring capabilities with bioweaponry, bio-experimentation, and soldier enhancement. The small amount of natives that were enlisted or used against their will made for easy subjects to test out as super soldiers that had the power to, with what you and I would call shapeshift. They called it something else. Most of the subjects that were enhanced and tested on were taken against their will, hand-selected because of the military's knowledge of their use of dabbling into dark magic, allowing them supernatural abilities. Those supernatural abilities were then enhanced and then put to the test on the battlefield in the name of our country. I know it might be a shock to you that the military has done all sorts of bio programs, but these have even predated World War II. Even the Germans were starting to dabble in this sort of testing with captured Jewish prisoners, 
There is very few people, if anybody, that lived long enough to actually release this information to the public, let alone talk about declassified information, so it's kind of hard to come by.